Hey there, Jason Hetler here, and in this video, I'm going to go over some slides that I presented on for a previous Apprentice Coach program uh, virtual event that we hosted at Altus. This presentation is titled Strength Training for Speed, and we'll cover various contexts of strength training. To begin, we have to set the stage with some common language. So as many of you are probably aware, we use a zonal system of categorization in the weight room. We term it zone 1, 2, and 3. And you can see in the box next to that the various methods that those relate to. So zone one is dynamic effort, zone two repeated effort, and zone three max effort. So I'll talk a little bit about this throughout the presentation, but this slide will lay some context for those zones. Next we have structural tolerance, the capacity of tendons, ligaments, and joints to withstand a progressive increase in physical training and muscle work is the ability of these tissues to resist fatigue and injury. We pair that with structural integrity, the synergistic capacity of the musculoskeletal system to operate in balance for effective force transfer and movement efficiency. So these two terms will come up in each of the different contexts that I present on today, and I'll talk about how they factor in with those various populations. Now that the stage is set, we'll talk about some of the specifics of how we'll implement strength training for speed beginning with a triathlon group that I've been working with the last few years. The first question is, what are we even doing in the weight room with a triathlon group? When, especially, the training can take upwards of 25 to 30 hours a week, how are we going to implement strength and power training, and why is it important? Well, we know that swim speed over the first approximately 200 meters correlates strongly with the final swim and overall race position in Olympic distance triathlon for both males and females. We know that elite male triathletes report on average 34 peaks of power output over 600 watts, which is quite extreme. And then we know that there's going to be some high intensity transitions and sprint finishes, even though the long duration of these events may not seem like that's going to be necessary. It is not uncommon for it to come down to a sprint finish. And then in this graphic, we can see a little bit of that high intensity nature of Olympic level triathlon. In the pink, we have wattage or power output. Yellow is cadence and RPM, and then green is the speed. The gray bars there are the elevation throughout, and then the blue is the temperature. So we can see just from the elevation profile that there's obviously going to be some high intensity involved, and that manifests itself in the power, the cadence, and the speeds. So beginning work with the triathlon group, there's a few considerations I had to take in mind. Even though they were elite population of performers on the triathlon course, they did have a low weight room training age. Historically, it was body weight training, it was a lot of core exercise, very low load, high rep type work. Their coach programs in four day training cycles, so it made it a little bit challenging at the beginning to understand which days of the week we wanted to be in the weight room. As a more of a consulting type role in this scenario, I wasn't really able to just adapt within those four day training cycles and change the days that we were in the weight room based on those four day training cycles. And so we needed to set a set schedule and then a lot of communication between myself and the head coach to make sure the implementation was on point. The other consideration that I had early on was hypertrophy. You know, making sure that these athletes weren't putting on a lot of mass through the strength and power training to ensure that it didn't contraindicate any performance measures that they were trying to achieve. So I mentioned that they're previous history in the weight room was very much low load, high rep manner. And that's exactly where we started. So we, we quickly got away from it, but I felt that it was a good point of emphasis at the beginning because it was something that they were a little bit more comfortable with and then could lay a foundation for us to progress from. So here through the general physical preparation phase, we used a, a blocked periodization scheme. So beginning with that zone two or repeated effort and a unilateral focus. And these blocks may be anywhere from two to four weeks typically. And then progress into a, a block of zone three or max strength with a bilateral focus. And lastly from there building into a zone one dynamic effort emphasis with varied exercise prescription between bilateral and unilateral. Here's just a few examples of some of the, we'll say staple exercises that I would program in this case. Bulgarian split squats, step-ups, and single-leg RDLs for zone two, 
squat, deadlift, and then a floor press and a seated row for zone three, max strength. And then zone one, a lot of hand cleans, Kaiser squats, and jumps and throws, which if you remember from the, from the first slide, jumps and throws don't necessarily fit into the typical loading parameters of zone one, but I included it in this category because I found it to be very beneficial with this group. After that roughly eight to 12 weeks of a block periodization scheme, we'd get into the winter of our training, the SPP. And here we would transition into a complex parallel periodization. I don't want to get caught up on the, the terminology of that. Some people may have a different term for this, but ultimately we were just alternating between each of the three zones each day that we were in the weight room. So say if we're in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday might be a zone two, then we might do a zone three on Wednesday and then a zone one on Friday and alternate through. So each zone each week if we're in there three times a week. Progressing to the competitive season, I utilize rollover cycles, which um, really comes from Dan Path. And it, it puts a lot of autonomy and emphasis on the athlete to integrate this kind of training into their schedule. They'll have a two or three day rollover. So they'll have workouts of two or three days. And then they just alternate through, similar to the complex, peri per complex parallel scheme, but they have a little bit more control of where those go into their training week. What I found was that that really didn't work very well. That, that first competitive season when they were traveling around Europe and North America, the weight training really fell to the wayside. And, and upon further discussion, you know, at first I thought that maybe that was just because they didn't see the importance or they weren't that bought into it. But they really were, and, and they wanted to include this kind of work, but they weren't quite at a point to take that kind of autonomy over it. So I gave them a little bit too much freedom in hindsight and I should have put more structure behind those sessions and when those sessions were meant to be included into their weekly schedules. Now that we're in 2020 and, and we've gone through eight or so months of, of training throughout a global pandemic, and so a lot of that training has been remote through video calls, it seems that they're, they're really a lot more comfortable with how to include this type of work. So I'm really excited for the future, especially as we get into the next competitive season of how we can continue with some consistency on this type of training. Lastly, with the triathlon group, the structural, intolerant, uh, structural tolerance and integrity work, there's a lot of considerations with this group. I'm not going to read uh, through this entire slide. You can kind of look through it. But a few of the key landmarks for me were their movement quality, posterior chain and adductor strength, T-spine and upper back, mostly mobility and, and just posture in that sense foot and ankle control, and then trunk stability and control as well. So these are a lot of the considerations and, and a little bit more specifically into how I would target those. And it was all underpinned by coordination. So a lot of the group, you know, a few of them grew up playing various sports and stuff, but a lot of them specialize in triathlon pretty early. And so their overall kind of general coordination is lacking in a lot of ways. And I found that it's, it's a really fun piece to target in the weight room. They seem to enjoy it. This population really enjoys those challenges. And, and so challenging them coordinatively has, has seemed to benefit greatly, particularly for them coming off the bike and getting into the postures and positions that they need to, to have an effective run to finish out the course. Now we're going to switch gears, move into the Chinese Athletics Association sprint group that I spent the last winter working with. I began with this group on December 1st of last year, and they range in age from 16 to 28 years old. So the reason I mentioned December 1st is because it was a little bit later than I would say is ideal. And so with that and a, and a few other things that we'll touch on, there's a handful of constraints present within this, this group and, and the implementation of the strength and power training. So here's a quick shout out to, to Coach Brett Bartholomew and this great infographic about the constraints. They make us improvise and adapt, reevaluate and reflect, and they make us more creative and innovative. And when I saw this, this graphic, it really tied extremely nicely into my experience with this Chinese group because the constraints manifested in all of those things mentioned. So we'll run through a few of them. And I have constraints here in quotes because not all these are, are maybe true to the definition of constraints, but they were things at least early on that I thought were going to be troublesome or an issue. And, and in most cases turned out to be not quite as much so, but it's still 
utilize the terminology of constraint around it. So first, it was a strong emphasis on max strength, more so than I would have normally placed myself. And this came from the lead sprint coach, as well as just the, the tradition and the culture that they come from. Now, again, with that constraint piece around this, in hindsight, it turns out that it really wasn't a constraint at all. I, I misidentified the group early on into thinking that they were quite a bit stronger than what they actually were. And so I think this emphasis on max strength was warranted. But the way that I factored it in at the beginning was to incorporate more mixed zone days. So most of the days that we were in the weight room together, they would have an element of max strength. So they'd have a compound bilateral movement typically. And that was so that I could talk to the head coach about what kind of weights they were moving in those key exercises that he was fond of. And also to just to satisfy their itch, so to speak, for that type of training because of the culture and tradition that they come from. So a pretty easy solution to implement in there. And it felt like it went a long ways, both to satisfy the other stakeholders involved, and then as well, as I mentioned, to target that max strength, which was more of a KPI than I originally identified. Next, the constraint for me was learning the organization of the sprint training. So coming in December 1st, they were already a couple months into training, and they had been in the weight room. And so I was trying to understand how the implementation was going and how I could best integrate into the type of work that they were doing on the track. Uh, blessing or a curse, they put a lot of faith in me early on, and so day one, they didn't want to give me a lot of information and, and just wanted me to take over the weight room. So I had to take a, a pretty gradual approach and, and try to draw some information out of them to what they had been doing and, and where they were at so I could integrate, in my mind, most appropriately. And then the, the programming on the track was quite fluid, which uh, is, is nothing that I'm not used to, but it still affects that integration of the strength and power. And so for me in the weight room is a matter of minimizing fatigue through consistency. So that if they were gonna have a, a harder sprint day that next day out on the track and maybe I wasn't quite aware of what that session was gonna be, I could minimize that, that fatigue through consistency through not changing the stimulus too often in the weight room and then just being adaptable and flexible in my approach. The structural tolerance and integrity work with this group really keyed in on them being over pushers, so spending a lot of time on the ground and being very quad dominant. Them being somewhat over specialized in general, or to generalize the group, I should say. And so the potential for that to lead into overuse injuries and similar with that triathlon group, as I mentioned, a little bit more on the uncoordinated side of things. And then they also had a very strong emphasis on squats, cleans, and crunches. These are very much a staple in their programming. So trying to offset or balance that out a little bit with more unilateral work and some general strength work. Now the last group that I'll, I'll touch on here is the elite Altus sprinters. This group, they're typically high responders. They already have a high training age. And that means that we'll blend some more non-traditional means of strength and power training with those more traditional means. And so because of their high responding nature, I think it's, it's really helpful to alter the stimulus a little bit more regularly than with some of the previous groups that I've highlighted. So this lends itself to more of an undulated periodization approach. And then really not necessarily true to that term to 100% because we'll incorporate some zone one as well as, as what we call potentiation preparation. So for us, that's usually on a, a Monday and a Thursday with some dynamic effort work. But the big days for us being the Tuesday and Saturday would fall under this undulating scheme of a block of extensification or more zone two work, repeated effort, and then a block of intensification or more max strength or zone three work, and then alternating between typically two weeks per block and then switch and back and forth. And then I mentioned some non-traditional means because of the high training age that they have. And, and one way that we'll do this is, is we consider the heavy resistance sprint training that we do with the 1080 sprint machine to be more of a special strength exercise as opposed to a, a sprint specific exercise because we load it up with around 100% body weight, especially early on in the season. And that percentage is relative to a plate loaded sled on turf. And so why on the surface it may look like it's, it's acceleration training or sprint training, for us it's really blending that line into special strength. And then just a, a quick slide here to highlight, kind of briefly highlight what we can see out of that 
we've got one kilo on the machine and then we have 30 kilos on the machine which is maxing out the machine which for this specific athlete is right about that 100 percent body weight relative plate loaded sled on turf so we see a, a massive increase in the peak force and the peak power experienced and sure that means that he's probably spending a lot longer on the ground the trunk angles are going to be a little bit differently but that's okay with us because like i said it's not sprint training it's more special strength training and so we're really looking for the overload on some of these measures so that's it in a nutshell uh, I go into much more detail within this presentation, which can be found on the Altus platform, but hopefully that highlights a few of the key points and gives some idea onto the approach for various populations. I showed a few exercises and some of the programming specifics. You can see on YouTube there, there's an Altus channel, and I have a, my own personal channel. Both of those will have a lot of exercise videos and, and more examples of the type of work that we'll be doing. Thanks.